Good evening and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd, and we're so glad you could join us for another hour of answering your gardening questions. Joining me on the panel tonight, we have our experts from Nebraska Extension, Fred Baxendale, our bug guy. Good morning. Evening, Kim. Evening. Uh, nice. Sitting in the turf chair, we have critter creature Dennis Ferraro. Great to be here in this rain. <laughs> Rots and spots person Lauren Geisler. Always great to be here, Kim. And our horticulture specialist tonight is Sarah Browning. Hi, everybody. You know, we'd love to hear from you as well. So if you have any gardening questions, you can just give us a call at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. Emails and pictures for future shows can be sent to byf at unl.edu. When you send us those questions, we really need as much information as you can give us, including at least which part of the state you live in. You can also follow Backyard Farmer during the week, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Pinterest, all that good social marketing and media stuff. Before we get to questions, Fred, you've brought us the insect that did the damage yes. and the damage. I did, I did. <laughs> so, you know, this is plum curculio, and it's really an interesting one. It's been with us since the earliest uh, colonial settled, uh, settlers arrived. As a matter of fact, they complained about problems with plum curculio in their apples and, and their other fruit trees. So it's been around uh, forever. It is actually native to North America. And if we look sort of here, I sort of put some up against a postage stamp. So you can see the size. It's a very small little weevil, uh, you know, less, you know, probably less than a quarter of an inch uh, in length. Uh, but the kind of damage it causes is quite profound. And again, most of us will experience this in our home orchards. I have lots of it in mind. Matter of fact, these samples uh, came from my orchard uh, that I don't spray as well as I should sometimes. So. Uh, what uh, Puncoculios lay their eggs underneath the skin of the apple, right, right as those apples are beginning to develop, or pears, or whatever, uh, or palm, or, or stone fruits, right? Okay. Once once the uh, the egg hatches, the the uh, the, the larva. Uh, goes down and feeds within the apple. And doing so, it causes this def deformation, deformity of the apple. And we can sort of see that here. And we refer to this kind of deformity as cat facing. And that's the same if it's on a pear, if it's on a strawberry. You know, we refer to this kind of <clears throat> deformation. Well, how they do this is really pretty cool. I'm just going to turn it around because I had almost everything I wanted on this sample. So what happens is, so the adult lays, chews a hole in the apple, and that's so you can sort of hopefully see this in that little black hole, right? And then it turns around and it cuts a sort of a sickle-shaped uh, slit around that egg. And that's so that when the fruit expands, it doesn't crush the egg, mm. all right? So what we see in, in uh, after a while uh, later on is we see this russeted area and that's very characteristic and we'll on the pear I think maybe we can see that russeted area and again I just hold up the crab apple and you can see the cat facing so in terms of control you need to control them very early on before the eggs are laid so that means cover sprays to your fruit trees uh, you know right after petal drop uh, for maybe Two or three applications, about eight to ten days apart. Perfect. Otherwise, you get a little protein with your deformed apple. Yeah, you do. <laughs> okay, Dennis. I hope there's nothing in those. No, I uh, <laughs> brought some boxes, uh, which we call box traps, and we talk a lot about them. And these are just three different brands, um, and these catch the animal alive. And what happens, they can walk in here and it flips them in the chamber. So some of these will hold up to 15 small rodents. And they're primarily used for things like voles or prairie mice or deer mice. And you just put a little bit of seed around the entrance. <coughs> Nothing, you don't need to put anything inside, just a little bird seed. They go in there and flips them over. And they will be alive and they'll remain alive for a while. Just, you know, if they're in the heat, you want to open it up and remove the rodents or they will succumb from the heat. And if it's cold, put some cotton balls in there and they'll last the night before something happens to them. So these are box traps, multi-catch traps for a lot of small rodents that we talk about 
you know, getting out of the way. And there are live traps, and when properly used, the animal will not die in the trap and will be alive for any, whatever you need to use the animal for. <laughs> Cool. And you were going to say feed <clears throat> your snakes. No, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dennis. Lauren, we've been talking about uh, this particular thing since the season started, actually. We have. And actually, yeah. last week on the show, we had a question about it, and I kind of blanked out and forgot about rust and then was enlightened about rust. And so now <laughs> we're going to talk about rust on our flowering, uh, uh, all of our, our <clears throat> excuse me, our flowering pears. And the rust that we're seeing, uh, this is a, a disease that is, is very much like cedar apple rust. So you can see on the, uh, the upper leaf surface, the rings, and then on the lower leaf surface, you can actually see uh, where the spores are coming from. Those little raised areas on there, uh, those little hair-like bodies, those are actually the ischia that we, we say that will produce the spores that go over and infect uh, the juniper. So just like cedar apple rust that will go to uh, a juniper, this will as well. And most of the time, uh, this one, you know, we talk about cedar quince rust, it'll even go some of your shrubby junipers. So the, the bottom line though is right now, you don't want to be spraying your pears or your apples for cedar apple rust because that infection cycle is over. Those spores are produced on the juniper, they come over and infect, and then this one, does not produce spores that reinfect. So this is quite different than a lot of other diseases that you deal with and try to manage, um, and, and is one that once the spores are produced here, those will go over to the juniper. So if you wanted to take any action for management, it would be when this is sporulating to protect a, a juniper in your, in your landscape if you had a lot of galling or something like that. So um, rust on pears, apparently very common this year, and uh, that's, well, we don't, got, don't spray. Yeah. And so if they're putting on new foliage, still don't spray. Yeah, and so the new spray. foliage, actually, there's some new leaves, and even right. we have one, I don't know if we can see this, but you can see there's some newer leaves that are not infected on these. So, yeah. um, you know, when you see this, you know, that's another good indication that you're dealing with a disease that isn't cycling back to the same plant, that it's a, a rust that's just coming on at this point. Excellent. So. Thanks, okay. Lauren. All right, Sarah, that's not very pretty. No, this isn't pretty either. <laughs> So this is the time of year when uh, we often see some stress symptoms on plants. This happens to be a little maple tree, and you can see the leaves here are um, not really the color they should be. They're a lighter green, but then also more pronounced, we've got this brown scorching around the edges of the leaves. This, um, this is pretty common in trees that are struggling or are stressed for a variety of reasons. This particular tree uh, was in a uh, kind of a shopping mall area. It only had about a six by six area for it to grow in, so about 36 square feet for this little tree's root system. It was surrounded by a lot of um, hard surfaces, um, roadways, uh, sidewalks, reflect, reflected heat from buildings. Um, so this tree is, you know, it, it has a limited root system because of the small planting area that it's growing in. And um, it, it's not being able to pull up enough water, you know, to keep the leaves fully uh, green. And so we're getting the scorching around the edges of the leaves. But we also see this, these types of symptoms in landscapes if trees have root issues uh, and are not growing well, or if they have trunk damage, uh, dead bark at the base can restrict water movement and you can see scorching like this. So there's a lot of things that can result in damage like this, but if you see this, it's indicating that your tree is, is struggling for some reason. And you need to do a little bit of investigation to figure out what's wrong and if you can correct it to help the tree do better. Now, you can also see symptoms of stress in evergreens. This happens to be a little um, Douglas fir. And here you can see on this uh, sample, we've, we've got some of the new growth dying back. Now, sometimes we see that as a result of disease. There are uh, fungal diseases like um, Cirrococcus shoot blight that can cause this kind of dieback but sometimes we see it just from stress or from drought. And I think on this particular sample, this, this just happened to be a very stressed tree. And it had these randomized little um, sections of new growth throughout the whole canopy that were dying back. So again, these are just symptoms of stress. They're telling you that there's something going wrong, that the, tr the plant is not doing well. And you need to do a little investigation and figure it out so you can help the plant do better. All right, and don't spray it with anything before you figure it out. Right, right. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. All right, Fred, you get the first picture question. Oh, excellent. This, this comes to us from Kozad, uh, a loyal viewer, and he says there is an insect oh. eating his kale. 
Yeah. And he wonders. What eats kale? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. I should, but what? So what is that? Do you think? Well, this it's this is a a, a nymph. It's it's a nymphal uh, harlequin harlequin bug. So it, it's an immature harlequin bug, and you know it says the adults are much much larger, uh, maybe well, considerably larger, maybe a half half an inch in length, and they're also brightly colored. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, they feed on a variety of of coal crops and, and other other related plants. So. It's one of those that, you know, generally aren't very abundant, and so you don't normally have to worry too much about them. Uh, they overwinter as adults, and what's sort of cool is that they lay, uh, the adult, the female, lays these clusters of sort of barrel-shaped eggs, and you'll see these little clusters of eggs uh, on the undersides uh, of, the, uh, of the cabbage leaves or the, or the coal leaves. And again, in terms of control, you know, generally you don't need to. Uh, you know, what I normally do, and when I grow those uh, cabbage or coal, what I do is I just sort of try to tap them off. <laughs> you, you can crush the eggs if you see the eggs, mm -hmm. or you can collect the adults and crush them or put them into a little bit of soapy or, water. Or flick. Right. Again, yeah, or flick them off. Well, except they'll come back. If you're, unless you're not if you flick hard enough. Yes, got to flick hard enough. <laughs> yeah. so, again, it's not one that's, that's usually too big a problem, and so probably don't worry too much about it, but it certainly is a, a curiosity, and they're absolutely gorgeous. You're in that group called shield bugs. Excellent. So. All right, thanks, Fred. All right, uh, Dennis, this is fun. Yes. This is actually an, an Iowan, but she sent us this picture from Florida where she has now relocated, and mm -hmm. it... it She's, it's a heron, huh? right. and, yeah. but she, the question is, do we, are the ones we see in our lakes here the same? And if we have lakes and ponds and we have herons, is there any hope for the fish? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> the fish are numerous and actually around here, herons this time of year are even more frogs than fish. They really love frogs and if we have enough frogs, whether they're bullfrogs or leopard frogs. Um, mostly around here we have, you know, great blue herons and green herons don't have this particular species, it's probably more of a warmer climate species, but we have plenty of herons around here and they do eat a lot of fish, but they won't eat enough that we have to worry about it. All right, they don't like them, you know, for the fish fry on Friday, they'll leave them alone. No, no, they always eat them on Wednesdays. <laughs> I have one of the fishes on my pond twice a day. Perfect. Yeah. All right, uh, Lauren, we've had a couple people send us pictures of Colorado blue spruce, and this one happens to be from Weeping Water, needle loss affecting most of the tree. And, and the follow-up question was, was it, as it appears in the picture, the interior needles? So uh, if we look at this picture, you can kind of see that, that it's not the newer growth, it's the older needles affected. And many of our needle cast diseases, that's what they'll do. They'll infect the needle uh, earlier than right now in the year on the current year needles and then they'll go through and, and that'll cycle and kill them out later. So um, it's something that you know management wise you really don't want to do anything now. Um, I would encourage <laughs> this person too to maybe even you know send a sample in or, or take it to a local extension office just to make sure we're dealing with the needle cast disease that I think it is. I couldn't zoom in and really see. We look for fruiting structures on the needles to confirm that but symptom wise it looks a lot like a needle cast uh, and and that you, know, you wouldn't do anything now, but I, I would encourage you to maybe take a sample in and make sure which one because the type of needle cast can affect how you manage it as far as when they infect and things. So All a little right. bit difficult to manage. All right, excellent. Thanks, Lauren. Sarah, you get this zucchini question, not because it's pretty, but <laughs> <laughs> because we had a lot of yeah. insects and a lot of path and people do love their zucchini, but not when they do this. What do you yeah. think happened? <laughs> So this to me looks like a pollination problem. You know, we, when we get into hot weather uh, in the summer, uh, pollination can stop when temperatures are, are 90 and above because for a couple of reasons, sometimes the pollen mm -hmm. dries out to the point where it can actually physically pollinate the flowers. Um, and so it, since, the, since these little zucchini are kind of dying from the blossom end inward, you know, it looks like a pollination issue to me. If that's the case, then when, when temperatures cool off, and we've just recently had a cooler period, I would expect you'd have more zucchini setting on. Now it's, it's hotter again, we're cycling back into hot again. So you may see this continuing, but as it, as it cools off later in August into early September, you'll probably see these plants producing more and, and um, 
you'll have way more zucchini than you really ever wanted. <laughs> All right, thanks, Sarah. Two more. Well, on East Campus at the University of Nebraska, we have lots of gardens, beautiful landscape beds, and of course, we are an arboretum, and we can show you some beautiful ornamentals, fruits, vegetables in our own backyard farmer garden. We rarely on the show get a chance to see what's happening on city campus. So for our first feature tonight, Jeff Culbertson is going to give us a first-rate tour. When you come visit city campus uh, this summer or at the end of the summer or early in the fall, if you're coming for a football game, we have a lot of gardens around many of our buildings on campus. Uh, that show a display of both annual perennial flowers, flowering shrubs, and ornamental trees. So there's a lot to see. We're going to start here in the Lead Center Sheldon Museum area. This bed right here has a mix of perennial flowers. We have dahlias that are in bloom right now. Uh, we have Daphne that's uh, very pretty in the spring and has variegated leaves. And as you can see, we, we've had lilies that are just starting to fade right now. So. Most of our beds have been well designed to have a variety of flowers throughout the season, something of interest all the time. Our staff does a great job. Tanner and his crew work hard in here to make sure that this, this area with the ponds and the beds and the annuals around here look good for you whenever you come. As I just mentioned, around Sheldon Museum, we have other walled gardens. Uh, this particular one has a mix of uh, native and uh, introduced perennials. We have some sedum getting ready to bloom, some lilies behind me. And then one of the plants that we've been trying to bring on campus, both on East End City, are some of the ornamental millets. This particular one, Jade Princess, uh, was provided to us with our Department of Agronomy and Horticulture helping us introduce some of these in here. So we've been working with them to bring those plants on campus. We think it's a nice addition and it's a fun plant to have. It might be something you wanted to try in your garden. On your visit to city campus, as you come to about 13th and R, one of the real highlights of campus is our Love Memorial Garden area, just south of Love Library. Uh, you really can't miss it. Uh, what's nice about this area is that we have a variety of flowers, trees and shrubs, native and well adapted to this area. So it's fun for you to come here. Many of the things are signs so you can see what would work well in your own garden. As you can see throughout this garden, we have the Coreopsis Russian sage, which I know sometimes can be a garden bully and it can be for us as well, but it really fills the spot and brings a lot of color and pollinators to the garden. Our asters are just getting ready for their fall bloom. Uh, many of the grasses are in flower right now that you can see. So there's really a variety of things going on all the time, which, you know, we talk about pollinators being important. We have a lot of things here that pollinators can use throughout the, the season. So as you come to campus this late summer and early fall for a football game or bringing your student to campus, there's a variety of places you can visit on campus. Over at Andrews and Burnett, farther north from here, there's a lovely perennial bed. Um, we have shrubs throughout Cather Garden and there's flower or perennial flowers, native perennials in Cather Garden you can take a look at. So throughout city campus there are places you can visit to get some ideas to help you in your own yard. People who love football love coming to those Husker games. Maybe you have a student enrolling here soon. So we do hope you'll take the opportunity to see all those wonderful landscapes on city campus. And it really has changed over the years. And it, kudos to landscape services and all those really hardworking people. Yeah. Yep. All right, your turn for a picture, Fred. Okay. Um, this is, and this is such a cool picture. Whoa. So uh, she found this giant, large green caterpillar on her uh, tomatoes, and then she found these on that particular worm. So what is the worm and what are the white yeah. things? Oh. My, my initial response is, wow, talk about all part of nature's wondrous pageantry. Exactly. I mean, this, is, this is really cool. Okay, so, okay, the worm, let's start with the worm. It's, it's a tobacco hornworm, mm -hmm. right? A tobacco hornworm, and it has been parasitized by, a, by tiny braconid wasps. And braconids are a very tiny wasp. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's a really cool system. So the the female, the wasp, finds the caterpillar, and it lays eggs inside of that caterpillar. Okay, the the the, uh, the larvae hatch, and they feed on. They just they clean out the caterpillar, but they don't take any of the critical the vital organs. 
so the caterpillar stays alive. And in this picture, with all that, the caterpillar is still alive. Ugh. I mean, not not healthy, mind you. <laughs> all right. Well, okay. So we got to get to the end of the story. So at the uh, after the uh, larvae uh, complete development, they. They, they emerge out of the body, they come up, and they spin cocoons, all right, which are often mistaken for eggs. So those look like eggs, they aren't. They're actually the cocoons of the wasps. Now, we don't want to, we, we want to preserve that, this insect, because out of those, all of those eggs, or out of those cocoons, are gonna come a host of other new wasps that are gonna go around and infest, infect, infest other caterpillars. So Very again, cool. it, it, it's such a cool system. It's so creepy. It's, it's called parasitism. <laughs> that is really creepy. <laughs> Every science fiction movie yeah, written Every, about some exactly. insect life cycle. It's alien in the garden. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. All right, Dennis. Well, let's let's come to something that's really interesting. Okay. This is <laughs> which is your favorite oh. subject, yeah. which is scat. And this is actually two different viewers sent us in pictures. I believe they're both Lincoln and the, right up next to the house. Mm -hmm. They wonder what uh, what critter did this and is it okay? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it looks like it's a very regular critter having good <laughs> volume. Um, by looking at the point at one end and the very essence, it's their bats. Mm -hmm. Probably Eptiscus fuscus, which is a big brown bat by the size. And what these bats are doing, they're flying by the windows from or around lights or light from the house eating moths and some insects, and then stopping to defecate, because they're eating quite well. And they'll do this every night. And so every night, you'll have a few more of these uh, droppings. There's nothing really to worry about. Just sweep them in the ground. They'll break apart and not cause any diseases or anything like that. There's not enough to worry about. And you can just sweep them right off into the soil. And the bat will come every night and get the moths until it gets colder. Cool. Cool. Very fun. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dennis. Really good fertilizer, aren't they? Yeah, they're pretty good you for like them. Good in your you mascara. Can, yeah, you can make mascara out of them too. Because <laughs> you can use Just some. Just in case you wondered, Laura. <laughs> I was looking for a new recipe for mascara, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, okay. So the, you get I'd this very cool picture, Lauren. This is actually from Northwest Oklahoma. Hmm. And I don't know that we've ever had pictures from a viewer from Oklahoma, but it's Austrian pines turning brown. They have begun to brown three to four branches at a time and then full full trees all of a sudden doing this. He, he did not tell us whether they have pine wilt going on in northwest Oklahoma, but any notion on what we might tell him about these particular pines? Well, there's a few things about it that, that kind of troubled me to say exactly what I thought it was, because you can see there's green tips on a lot of these branches. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it's probably not a canker of any kind. Uh, the, the typical needle blight diseases that we see it doesn't really look even like that too mm -hmm. much. So um, on a pine like that, I don't know if uh, there's any insect thing, Fred, that could do that. Right. It looked like it accumulated over time. Yeah, right. And it, but it's not, it's not, I really wouldn't call it pine wilt because it's of bizarre. the way it's got green, a lot of green tips on things. So yeah. it'd um, be nice to have a specimen. To... Unfortunately, with that one, I would recommend, you know, taking a sample and try to get a little bit of the branch with some green tip and then the dead, and then maybe even some of those those areas that are fully dead, you know, a branch of that, just to see if there's any evidence of some activity. And then always look for cankers because the tip could be the last part to go and it would decline, but um, not anything that really stands out. Uh, and so, that's a, that could be a pretty dry environment, I would think, where they're at. So right. it may just be some of the stress. So one thing they could do if it is really dry, um, you know, I would make sure that you're giving it some water and avoiding stress because that will also favor a lot of our, our different diseases that can lead to decline of trees like that. Right. We'll give a shout out to Oklahoma Extension. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, they have a diagnostic lab at, at Oklahoma. Right. All right. So that would be good. Sarah, this viewer sent us uh, pictures of what he's calling vines <laughs> growing in his windbreak. And he wondered what they were and then how in the world do you get rid of them? Yeah. This is called greenbrier, or sometimes it's called catbrier. Uh, and it's a, a, a weedy vine with these horrible thorns on it, as you can see in this picture. Um, it's a perennial, and it comes back from a, a fairly extensive rhizomatous root system. Uh, and it can be difficult to control. So 
what I would suggest is that you cut them down. You're going to have to, you know, use some gloves and pull them out of the plants that they're growing in and cut them down and then do a stump treatment with either triclopyr, which you can find in brush killer products, or Roundup. Um, either one will work as a stump treatment. And then give it about, you know, two or three weeks to see if anything grows back. If it starts to grow back, you know, then um, I would spray the regrowth with the diluted triclopyr and just follow the triclopyr label as far as how to, um, how to mix it up. Um, so yeah, it's a, um, since it's actually kind of a woody plant, uh, it can be difficult to control. So you might have to make more than one application. But the triclopyr does a pretty good job on it. Right, as long as they do cut and cut right. and spray. Right, and I should also mention well. it's undiluted. When, when you're using the stump treatment method with the triclopyr and the Roundup, it's undiluted product. It's, it's, total, it's concentrate right out of the <laughs> bottle. Right. And usually you'll use a paintbrush and you'll just paint it on the freshly cut stump. Right. So don't dilute it and then put it on. That won't work. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Well, we are beaming with pride about our garden this year. Not only do we have our fruits and vegetables coming in nicely, but there is a wide variety of those beautiful All America selections, and they are just bursting with color. Let's take a minute to hear from Terry James about some of the combinations that are blooming right now. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're walking around and taking a tour of what looks good. What we did right for this year to make notes so that we can do it again for next year. We're looking at some of the new plants that we have. The tequila lime zinnia is looking fantastic up against that new red hibiscus that we have. Those two colors are really playing off of each other and they're a great backdrop to the edge of our bed. We're also looking at the Celosia plume. It is kind of a medium background. So if you have a little bit of smaller garden, you can use that as a background. And it looks really good against that cherry zinnia that we have from the All-America Selection winner. That little zinnia is just blooming and blooming. Just takes a little bit of deadheading and it hasn't stopped blooming all summer long. We also have a fantastic backdrop. So if you have some grasses, think about getting that South Pacific Scarlet Canna that we have started by seed so anybody could order that seed and start it in your in your greenhouse over the winter. Look at how great that coral flower looks against that green of hue of that Dallas blues grass. So that's what's happening in the backyard farmer garden. Stop on by. And that is one of the fun parts of gardening to have a good plan in your head for those combinations and then actually enjoy them working out the way you thought they would, which is sometimes kind of rare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, Fred, a couple of Japanese beetle questions, and this is Omaha elkhorn. Oh, surprise, um, surprise. Yeah. One, uh, the first one really is, is malathion an effective treatment for Japanese beetles? Probably not. It, it, I mean, it just doesn't have enough residual to get the job done. I mean, I, I much prefer things like bifenthrin uh, or imidacloprid or one of those types of products. All right, thank you. Bellevue, Dennis, okay. their, their, their dog is doing the dog thing and barking at something it hears, and it sounds like a police siren in the woods. <laughs> What's the dog barking at? Um, a police siren in the woods. A screech owl if it's in the evening. Wow. I would go to a screech owl in the evening. It's the only thing I could think of in Sarpy County that would be close. And lots of times when I hear screech owls, they sound very much like a, uh, a siren. So. Okay, all right. Or I would go with that. All right, probably one of those. Or a siren in the woods. Yeah, or a, a, <laughs> a, no, a toddler when one of those siren things on his bike. You know, <laughs> yeah. it could be either, you know. It could be. All right. Um, Lauren, this is in Prairie Home, and they have a, a plum, superior plum, and the plums are rotting, and then the leaves are also falling off of adjacent cherries. So... Anything yeah. come immediately to mind without um, pictures well, with, or without uh, Fred's with insects? A lot of the stone fruits, uh, you know, we see brown rot, so mm -hmm. that would be one that would come to mind with rotting fruit. So uh, next year, I wouldn't try to manage it now, but make sure you use sanitation. Uh, you'll get some fruit mummies and things with that, so make sure you're cleaning it up. Use sanitation, and then uh, next spring, if you really want to control it, start a, a fruit tree spray program. All right. Sarah, this is in Gotham, 
uh, and they, uh, this viewer has many different pumpkins and gourds. She wants to know how she can tell when they're ripe, she or he. How, how do you tell when okay. they're ripe? Um, so pumpkins, um, usually the skin, the skin will get really firm so that you have a hard time pushing your fingernail into it when the pumpkin is getting ripe. <coughs> now gourds, the skin is pretty much always hard as the, the fruit is maturing. So. Um, but they'll get a, they'll get a little dry, and um, they'll feel lighter as they start to mature, as they kind of dry out a little bit. Um, but the skin will still be really firm. So, um, you know that's, and you know if if you're unsure, just look at your seed packet and look at the days from seeding to harvest, and that'll give you kind of a general time frame when these things should be ripening. Sarah, are you ready? You bet. From Prague. We have a question about, will iris grow where black walnuts are growing? Uh, they'll do okay, yeah. All right. We have uh, viewers who have long new growth on their ewes. Can they prune those whippy tips right I wouldn't now? do it now in the heat of the summer. I would wait until, um, well, and you don't want to encourage new growth before fall that might not harden off. So actually at this point, I would probably wait until maybe like mid-October and then maybe do your pruning. All right, when should viewers put uh, protection around the trunks of their soft bark trees for frost crack or sun scald? That can be done in the fall, you know, in uh, mid-September through, you know, end of October. All right, this viewer heard that maples should be pruned when they're in full leaf. Have you heard that before about maples? Well, maples can be pruned when, when in the summer. It helps <coughs> avoid sap leaking if they're pruned during the dormant season. But here again, I wouldn't prune during the middle of the heat. All right. I'd wait till the fall. <coughs> Are peas a good fall crop for this part of the state? Sure. Yeah. All right. Good. Nice job. You ready, Lauren? I'm ready. <laughs> what happened uh, to lunch meat? I'm, I got <laughs> You're no, not hungry. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> had some good head cheese this week. Ready like head cheese. How about that? Here we go. Okay. Um, a viewer wonders whether slime mold is toxic to pets. Not that I'm aware of, but some of those different growths can be, so I would just it, it wash it away with a hose or something to avoid anything. All right. We have a viewer who says they have red spots like needles, uh, like measles on their dogwood leaves. What's that? Um, it's going to be a fungal leaf spot. Dogwoods get a cercospor disease that causes red spot. So uh, avoid overhead irrigation. Probably not going to kill the tree. It should be fine. All right. Apple trees are showing up covered with spots this time of year. What is that and what to do? It's rust, just like we talked about earlier, most likely. Uh, it could be other foliar diseases that are common. Don't spray them now. If it's a fruiting apple, get on a tree spray program next year. All right. And this is also an apple question. All of a sudden, big dead branches with black on the branches. What's that? Uh, large dead branches with black. So some sort of a canker is what I would go with on that. So if you want to try to manage that, I would prune that out about three to four inches below the affected area. All right. Asters are browning from the bottom up. Okay. Uh, browning bottom up, most likely a root rot if it's bottom up, burning on, a, on an aster. So it's good indication it's stressed. It's probably not going to make it, you might guess. Not anything to do right that now. That was a really bad answer. Yeah, We're not yeah. going to give you any credit. You shouldn't give me any credit. I was I really thinking, so I'm going to go back real quick. I want to comment. So the black uh, on apples, fire probably fire blight. Fire blight. So, yeah, yeah I was yeah. thinking canker Good, large. We're, we're yeah. both sitting down here. Yeah, fire blight, seven to ten inches below the affected area. Cut that right. out for bacterial disease. <laughs> Dennis, are you ready? I'm as ready as lunch meat. Okay. <laughs> we'll trade. <laughs> Whatever that means. Okay. Um, we had a viewer wonder whether using pepper spray on their plants will keep the critters from chewing away. Um, if there's other food sources, yes. If not, no. Okay. What is the most dangerous small rodent to humans in terms of disease or, or not biting, but? A house mouse. And what does it? And, uh, tons of diseases and rats with the plague too. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, we have, uh, we have viewers in, in kind of the Blair area seeing squirrels that appear to be hairless. What's that all about? Okay, when the population of fox squirrels gets too thick, they get a mange and those won't make it through the winter. So it's self-limiting. So don't overfeed them. You'll mm -hmm. cause more mange. All right. Um, we have a viewer who saw a raccoon at, during daylight, like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, wandering about in the street, and then it went down the sewer. What's up with that? 
Uh, he has a hangover from last night. No, um, <laughs> it could be diseased or it could be he's forced out of the sewer because of heavy water. Uh, it's hard to say, but stay away from him no matter what. All right. Do we have feral pigs right now? In... No, we've gotten rid of them, okay. but they can always make their way back. All right. So put up the, put up the pig fence at the border. Yeah. All right. right. All right. Are you ready, Fred? I'm ready. Is it time to do something like a perimeter spray around homes to keep the insects out? Sure. You know, as we approach the, the cooler temperatures, that's when the insects start to move in. So don't forget to put out some sticky traps. All right. Uh, a viewer sent in pictures, actually, and asked a question about crown gall and euonymus. Should those be cut out or what? Yeah, I think, I think so. You know, again, it depends how low it is in the, in the crown of the, of the plant. Okay. But, you know, difficult. All right. Um, a question about a single carpenter bee drilled a hole in the soffit. Is that to worry about? Oh, or... Potter's Nature's Wondrous Pedgerine. Mm -hmm. Just don't worry about it. You know, if, if there's a colony of them, that's different. Yeah. One, enjoy it. No big deal. All right, what about velvet ants? Are they around? Oh, and... yeah, bet. They're, they're so cool. The males are little, little flighty uh, winged creatures, but the adults, but remember, they have a very formidable sting. So don't touch them. All right. Uh, bumps on the hackberry leaves. Lots of questions about those Hack right now. Yeah, hackberry nipple galls uh, caused by hackberry psyllids. Again, um, they won't hurt the tree. All right, excellent. Nice job, all. Lots of questions. All right, Sarah, we're not going to ask you to pick up the plant of the week, <laughs> okay. but it is fabulous that Gladys, uh, with some help on this one, thanks to BJ, brought in this incredible plant. You bet. It's beautiful. And what is it? This is uh, this is a tropical plant, uh, not native to Nebraska. <laughs> it's called, well, the botanical name is uh, Adenium obesum. It's called Desert Rose is the common name for this. It's actually native in the Arabian Peninsula and in North Africa. So it's hardy to zone 10, which is like the very southern tip of Florida. So it won't overwinter in Nebraska. But obviously, it, you know, you could bring this in the house and you could overwinter it indoors if you wanted to um, grow it outdoors as a, as a summer patio kind of a plant. Um, it grows from these really interesting um, fleshy stems and fleshy roots, which serve as kind of a, a water storage uh, organ for the plant. And if you break the stems, you get a really watery sap that comes, that comes out. Um, as far as growing it, it likes very high light. It needs very, very bright sun to bloom well. Um, and, uh, and kind of, you know, moderate water. You want to, you know, water it well and then let it dry out between waterings. Um, it comes in a variety of flower colors. Gladys is a, is a beautiful kind of a tricolor with white and then red around the tips. It also comes in red and, and various other colors. And uh, single flowers, double flowers, so you can get uh, a wide variety of flower shapes on this plant. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a, um, Gladys says hers was about three feet tall and then she cut it back and, um, and it's growing out. It's almost kind of in a cool bonsai kind of a shape at this point. And so it's a really beautiful specimen. But then of course we it's expect Gladys. great things from Gladys. <laughs> so it's, it's beautiful. It's Gladys. Well, and, and thanks again to Gladys and BJ for bringing that in. And Definitely. It's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. All right, Fred, uh, <clears throat> picture number three for you. This is a, uh, a viewer in Howells, or near Howells, uh, honeydew, and the vines just went down. Yeah. Kind of overnight, um, she did notice right. squash bugs, so she <clears throat> figures yeah. that's what it is, maybe, but the, she wants to really know what, what can she do here to save the melons, or is it? Yeah, well, I may put the, you know, put the hit also on Laura, but to me, that looks like bacterial wilt, mm. uh, which is very common. It's transmitted by cucumber beetles. Okay. Yeah, so the whole key is going to be to control the cucumber beetles when they're active. And cucumber beetles will transmit that disease, uh, be it when they're feeding on the leaves, when they're feeding on the roots. Uh, and of course, cucumber beetles are sort of ubiquitous in, in, in our garden. Mm -hmm. So would you have any other counsel well, for? The only other thing would be just sanitation is really important with that. Right. So this fall, make sure you're cleaning up really well. Uh, that'll help reduce that. Right. And, and, and again, you know, when you, when you, if those plants that have died and if they have fruit on them, you don't want to just take them out and put them on your compost pile right. because the beetles are really good flyers. They'll go back and forth. Uh, and you know they'll pick up that uh, that bacterium and take it back uh, and, and contaminate other plants. So again, 
put them in, put them in a trash receptacle of some kind, the, the ones that have been killed. All right, thanks, Fred. Dennis, yeah. um, we don't know where this viewer is, but uh, she has a green pepper plant that doesn't have any foliage on the bottom. The branches are eaten off. She says she didn't do it. <laughs> okay, uh, I believe her. She's wondering if it's grasshoppers, and we don't think no, so. No, I think the way, it's, the way it's cut off, but yet the fruit is not touched, I'm going with rabbits. Uh, ground squirrels and woodchucks would take the fruit as well, whereas rabbits very seldom take the fruit. They'd rather have the leaf material. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the height of which those are taken off, and I can't see whether there's peg incisor marks behind the regular incisors, which are indicative of lagomorphs which are rabbits because they're not rodents, but it looks like rabbits. All right, so the, uh, the usual exclusion. Right? Yeah, um, a late. fence with uh, about two foot up, about four inches in the <coughs> ground around the whole garden would keep them out. All right, Lauren, um, this is a Bellevue viewer and she has sent us a picture of uh, early glow strawberry plants with these with these spots on the foliage, any notion on disease on this one? Uh, well, it's it's definitely a fungal leaf spot. It looks like uh, there's a common strawberry leaf spot. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also leaf blotch. Some of those that are more longer lesions could be. Mm -hmm. um, I would look at it. Doesn't look like there's any mulch under them, so I would encourage mulching underneath. Straw mulches work really well. Um, and then make sure you're you're not overhead irrigating. So uh, soaker hoses in strawberry beds are really nice. Uh, that and some mulch, and that's going to do a lot to help uh, manage your leaf spots next year. Uh, the other thing, make sure you have some things to anything you can do to allow air circulation and movement to dry those leaves out. So that would be the first line I would do. All right. Uh, the other thing I need to comment on, since I was awarded the really bad answer of the night on the lightning round, um, <laughs> anytime you see uh, any type of a plant burning from the bottom up when it's dry, it's a good indication that you have a crown and root rot. So that would affect you know asters, coneflowers, anything like that. If you see leaf spots on those leaves, then that could be more of a fungal disease that we would be dealing with. So we really want to assess the difference between the two. If you have just general burning and it's crowned root rot, that plant's not most likely going to make it through the next winter. So start thinking about replacement. All right, excellent. Good, good follow up. We'll, we'll give you to, a had to come back on arrears. That, so. No point. I don't. I don't. You know. <laughs> I know I'm not here to win. I just <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> yeah, yeah sure. Okay, Sarah, you have uh, two different uh, pears blasting their bark, uh, or bad pears. Uh, this one's in Blair, and the extension office there did say probably environmental with inclusion and all sorts of things. And then the other one has six of these that are showing this sort of. Um, t really not great structure. Mm -hmm. What are we going to tell our, our viewers on these two? So we had a, a situation that happened back in November of 2014 where we had some, our night temperatures early in November were pretty moderate down in the 50s and 40s. And then very suddenly, I think the third week in November, we had temperatures that dropped down into the single digits for several days in a row. It's, it's night temperatures in the single digits, I mean to say. and. A lot of trees weren't sufficiently hardened off to be able to tolerate that big temperature change. And so what we saw is a lot of bark death. And w coming into 2015, so we saw some trees that were so heavily affected that they just died outright. We saw a lot of cherries, or um, weeping cherries, various trees like that, just completely dead in the spring of 2015. We, we saw some plants that had branch dieback and now what we're seeing is trees that had bark die, that bark is now shedding. Mm -hmm. And so as the trunk of the tree continues mm -hmm. to expand, you get splits in the bark where the bark is dead and it's not growing anymore. And then that, that outer dead bark is falling away. So the prognosis on these trees is, is kind of variable. It depends on um, how much of the bark is affected you can kind of get an indication from the overall look of the canopy. I mean, did the tree fill out a nice, healthy canopy this year? Did it put on a good amount of growth? If it did, then the tree might be able to survive. If, though, you're also seeing branch dieback above these areas of dead bark, then the, the damage may be extensive enough to the point where you'll see that tree continue to decline and die. So unfortunately, there's nothing really directly that you can do to help these trees at this point. There's, there's no point in putting a wound dressing on these dead sections of dead bark. You know, that's not going to help at all. You don't need to spray with a fungicide or with an insecticide. 
you can try to support the tree and try to make the tree vigorous um, so that if possible it can it can seal off these sections of dead bark and and survive but that would just be through basic management that would be making sure the tree is mulched at the base making sure the tree stays watered if we have dry periods and then preventing secondary insects from coming in you know or or uh, controlling borers and things like that all right so thanks sarah wow. Well, the university prides itself on offering great learning experiences for its students. A lot of that comes in the classroom, but there's no better learning than that where they do things. We recently went out to the Panhandle Research and Extension Center to see how their internship program helps students understand what they can learn in the classroom. Well, the interns we have, we have three this summer uh, that we're working with. Uh, Chrissy Peters, who is uh, through Kim Todd there in Lincoln. Uh, she's going to be working in the Arboretum here at the center. And she's also working out at the Nature Center at the Wildcat Hills. Uh, we have Michaela Stark. Uh, she's uh, here. She's going to be working on our hops project. And uh, that is through South Dakota State is, is where she is from. And uh, then Erica Bowman, uh, who is uh, with uh, Bruce DeVork uh, out of the Lincoln campus. She's going to be working with some growers in the area with her water management on their center pivots and uh, try and help them use less water and uh, get more, more crop out of that. And all three of these girls are local. They're from the Scottsbluff Gearing area. I came to the University of Nebraska for an internship to learn more about agriculture and landscaping practices. I'm mainly working with the hops program. So far we put the posts up and strung the wires and then we're going to hang the irrigation system up and plant them and then we'll fertilize them and water them and stuff. And I work with the other intern Chrissy Peters a lot and we do different landscaping things. Mostly we've just been cleaning up the grounds right now and we were going to move a couple trees and stuff and pruning the rose bushes. So the internship I'm working for is um, the Partners in Pollution Prevention and it interests me because we're helping to reduce waste at the source and make um, processes more efficient. Starting out so far I've met a couple of producers in the area and we're going to work with them to um, insert soil moisture probes, and those measure how wet the soil is to optimize when they um, irrigate. And um, so far I've helped with the hops project and uh, planting beans this morning. Uh, we want to give them as much experience as we can, so there's gonna be a different activities. Uh, right now we're planting beans, so we just came out from uh, uh, going out in the field and marking out the plots where the beans need to go. Uh, they will be doing uh, interviews such as this. Uh, we've also had them on the radio locally, which has been good. Um, they will be going out on calls with me to look at the uh, different problems that our growers have in our gardens and lawns, and, and especially trees. We, we want them to learn and experience as much as we can the different things of agriculture that, that are out there. We are really fortunate to have such good educators and those enthusiastic students doing that work out west, and it's fun to see both, and we, and we appreciate all their efforts. All right, Fred, last picture. Um, this is a viewer who wants, she's in McCook, and she, she wanted to know what these caterpillars were, and then she said they were Gorgon. Gor -gor Gorgani. Gor Gorgani, checker spot caterpillars. That's correct. She wanted to know, um, whether she could actually rear some. So she knew what they were and she wondered how to raise them and I think you brought in the, the I, beautiful I did. I just, new I, one. I thought it'd be kind of fun just to show. Yeah. So this this is what the, uh, you know, this is what the adults look like. They're real, you know, a fairly small little butterfly but they're absolutely gorgeous and they're certainly ones that we want to preserve for both their pollination and for their aesthetic uh, appearance in, in our landscapes. So, and they're, they're Common throughout the Midwest, we see them a lot in prairies, mm -hmm. you know, strip in forest edges, uh, along stream beds, those kinds of places. You know, they would be pretty common. 
So yeah. in terms of that second part of the question, Bo, you know, you know, again, it, it's difficult to, to, to rear these, these animals, these insects uh, often, but you know, one thing you could do is you could try putting a mesh cage uh, well, just putting them on, on a plant, uh, like a sunflower, because they like sunflower, and, and just putting them on a plant, or if you want to try caging them, you know, put them in, in a large cage over some, some small uh, sunflower plants, and just see how well that works. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do because, you know, they're used to flying around and moving around, and, you know, anytime you put them into an artificial environment, you know, they, you often struggle in rearing them. All right, thanks, Fred, and thanks to her for those pictures. All right, Dennis, there's actually a picture of a box trap uh, okay. from a viewer, oh, and, yeah, cool. and they want to know where to get them. Okay, um, you can buy, there's several, like I said, there's literally dozens of brands of box traps. Some hold up to three or four, some hold up to 15. You can get them online, just go multi-catch box traps and get, you know, through Amazon or any other online. Or in town, I would try your farm stores. Um, more than your box stores, but stores that have a lot of farm equipment usually have a variety of the box traps. All right, excellent. Thanks, Dennis. Lauren from Omaha. This uh, this viewer said this particular issue in her turf began probably in July, and um, sadness is happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's going on? <laughs> well, and it, it looks uh, the symptoms are really good as far as you know the oh. photos. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's a summer patch that's showing up in the full sun areas in the lawn, I would guess. Uh, it's gonna be something that reoccurs in that same area. Uh, not really anything to do right now. You can you know, just understand that those rings have reduced root systems. So just make sure you're providing adequate moisture. And then next year, uh, in the spring, when that turf is actively growing and we get our soil temperatures above 50 degrees, that's where we come in and put a fungicide application. You really just can treat the areas that are affected in the lawn from the previous year. Um, and, and just go in and, and put that in and make sure you water it in so that fungicide gets down to the root system. And then, uh, you know, an application in the spring may be followed up about three weeks later and, and you're gonna be in a lot better shape next summer. All right, thank you, Lauren. Last question with a picture, Sarah. Um, this is a Blair viewer. This is a kill it or keep it. Uh, and it's about four feet tall now and about four feet wide. Red stems, what is it and what does she do? This is pokeweed, yep. and um, very common weed, um, grows very fast uh, once it gets seeded into your garden. See those little berries on there? Birds love to eat those when they ripen, and then they'll spread the seeds around, and so you'll, you'll get these seeding into your garden. But those, those big leaves and red stems and, and that kind of um, panic, panicle sort of structure <clears throat> for the fruits is very characteristic of pokeweed. So get rid of it. All right. <laughs> Don't enjoy it, just right. mm -hmm. rogue. Some roguing going on, Lauren. Because you don't want to chill. Yeah. <laughs> you go. you got to be careful. Yeah. Got to be careful. You got to be real careful yeah. with it. All right. Yeah. We have a handful of announcements, two or three of them. The first being our, our backyard farmer open house in the garden, the 13th of August, 10 to 12, east of Kime Hall. This is number two. Second is the Greater Omaha Iris Society sale, Friday, August 19th, 2 to 8, St. Andrews in Omaha, with a number on your screen for that one. Third one is that we will be at the fair. We're gonna be uh, the panel itself, ourselves, 1.30 in the uh, afternoon, and then we'll be taping at four o'clock in the, in the Nebraska building at Grand Island. So lots of fun. Go eat a corn dog. Yes. And uh, Fred, we have time for just really one more question, and we might as well attack the Japanese beetle question again. Okay. This is uh, Elkhorn viewer, river birches, 30 feet tall and leaves are being skeletonized. Do we think this yep. is Japanese beetles? Almost, almost certainly, again, Japanese beetles feed on over 300 different species of, of plants. And Everything, we're yep, done so to go. could be. You know, again, fortunately, the thing about it. we're at the end, we're at the end right. of the Japanese beetle adult season, so. Nothing to do. Yep. 